Hello everyone, it's Greg from Edinburgh Renaissance Fencing Academy here for another online tutorial. Uh, this week's tutorial is going to be a little bit different from the previous ones that I've done. Um, instead of teaching you some techniques or demonstrating training exercises, I'm going to talk about error correction and uh, how to develop your fencing skills, how to get better, which is after all the point of most martial arts training. Uh, so in the video, I'm going to cover uh, four of the most common problem areas for people training in historical fencing styles. Um, I'll talk about them in very general terms as much as possible. Um, so these are applicable to any style of historical fencing or historical European martial arts that you might be studying. Um, so hopefully it gives you some good ideas to take away and think about and use to improve your own fencing. So without further ado, uh, let's start with problem number one. Uh, standing in the wrong posture or having bad posture. Okay, uh, the majority of martial arts systems from around the world advocate standing in a particular stance or a particular set of stances uh, when you're fighting. Um, this is for a simple reason that it puts your body in a prepared shape or a prepared state for performing the techniques which are specific to that art which you're studying. Um, this means that if you are not in the right posture or the right stance, you won't be able to perform the techniques correctly. While if you are in the right stance, all of the movements, all of the techniques will be performed with a maximum efficiency. Um, there are a few different ways that people can go wrong with uh, posture or stance. Um, the first one, which is very common, um, people can learn the stance, supposedly correctly, but then as soon as they start moving around or doing techniques, it all falls apart because they're focused on the sword uh, or hitting the other person or parrying or whatever, and then their posture gets terrible. Um, Second way things can go wrong is people don't really stand in a proper uh, system specific stance at all. They fall back on something instinctive. For example, hunching forwards in a sort of predatory uh, posture or flinching away because they don't want to get hit uh, or just kind of lounging about. Um, so these are, as I say, instinctive for humans when we're standing with nothing in our hands, but that's not applicable to a weapon-based martial art or a combat situation in general. So try not to do these things. Uh, and then the third possibility, especially for more experienced fencers or martial artists, is where they either deliberately or unconsciously use the stance from one art when they start to learn a new or different one. Um, so once again, I'll just emphasize, one art will have a set of postures for that art. They're not necessarily good for studying a different style. So try to differentiate this in your head. Okay, how can we correct this? Um, obviously, feedback from an instructor is the primary method, but if you don't have this available, there are a few things you can do. Um, firstly, uh, as much as possible, refer to diagrams from the source book, the source treatise that your style is based on. Um, if you don't have access to those diagrams or there aren't any diagrams, then try to look at a video or a photograph of a good instructor demonstrating this. Uh, and then compare yourself to this. Constantly compare yourself to this. You should try to be really critical and get your stance correct. Um, use a full-length mirror if you're training at home, or use a digital camera to record yourself and then look afterwards. Um, there are a few key points in your body to watch out for. Um, firstly, look at the feet in the original diagram. Are they close together or far apart? Are the feet angulated or linear or in a sort of L shape? Um, Secondly, look at the hips and waist. Uh, how is the instructor or the, the master standing? How are they holding their weight in this region? Very important for balance. 
Um, and lastly, look at the shoulders. Uh, are they uh, profiled towards the opponent? Square on? Something in between? Is it a reverse stance somehow? Um, so the positioning of the shoulders can tell you a lot about the angulation of the body. To help, uh, to help you with this process, I'm going to give you a little exercise you can do at home. I'm going to insert two diagrams from different fencing treatises. Uh, one is from the late 16th century, uh, an Italian system by Di Grassi, and the other is also an Italian system, but from the late 19th century by Parisi. Uh, spend a little bit of time comparing these two, do two diagrams. Uh, look at the feet, look at the waist and hips, and look at the shoulders. And you should find that despite a superficial similarity, there are actually lots of differences there. Okay, moving on to uh, point number two, problem number two. Um, I will cover this uh, much quicker than before. Um, this one is uh, moving like a modern sports person. Uh, if you watch lots of videos online of modern sports, modern combat sports even, you'll see lots of people bouncing around like this, jumping forwards and backwards. Um, there are reasons for doing this in modern sport, of course, top level Olympic fencers, for example, do this. Um, however, this is almost certainly not how historical combat fencers moved. Uh, you can read again and again in fencing treatises about the need to keep your weight down, to keep one foot firmly flat on the ground at all times and to move slowly, smoothly, and cautiously. Um, so, don't move like a modern sports person if you're not studying a modern sport. Try to replicate correct historical movement. Smooth, cautious, flowing, and keep your weight down. Okay, moving on to uh, problem area number Three, which is not understanding the weapon correctly. Um, in order to understand a weapons-based martial art properly, you have to understand the original weapon that the master was using or, or advocated his students using. Um, when you do training in a modern environment, there are a lot of different training tools available now, and uh, most of these are good. Um, they range from something like this, which is a custom-made uh, reproduction of a, an original sword from a museum, a late 16th century Italian rapier. Um, I paid a top-level swordsmith quite a lot of money to have this sword made, and it's very close in uh, weight, in size, in design features, and in handling to the original sword which I have also handled in a museum. At the other end of the scale would be something like this. Uh, it's not really a weapon at all, it's purely a training tool. Um, this is a, a simple cross-hilted wooden waster. There are also synthetic wasters out there. And there are also variations on types of foil. There's the classical fencing foil. Um, there's the so-called Federschwert, which is effectively a longsword foil. Um, there are other training tools as well, like the single stick for training sabre and backsword, and so on. Lots of things available. Um, so, the problem is, uh, if you use something like this, or if you use a reproduction sword which isn't as good quality as this, it won't handle like an original weapon. If you don't go back to the original source and understand the weapon that you're meant to be training to use, this will be confusing. Uh, the big danger is that you'll end up training to use a training tool, but the purpose of the original system is to train to use a real sword. You can use a training tool, but you always have to keep telling yourself, this is too light, or this is too small, or this is too flexible, or, or whatever it is about the training tool. 
um, that's a feature of its design. Uh, and the last thing I'll say uh, about this point is um, there are actually a lot of cheap to mid-range sword reproductions which superficially look like historical swords uh, and are sold as being reproductions of historical swords but in fact they don't handle anything like the originals. So whatever you're studying get some information about the weapon. Go and look in a museum catalogue or a museum website. Um, there are plenty of these available online. Uh, look at the blade length, uh, look at the weight, look at the point of balance and look at the specifics of the grip and guard design and think about the implications of that for the techniques of your system. Okay, uh, and then moving on to problem number four. Uh, this is the last one in this video. Uh, problem number four is concentrating too much on scoring a hit. Um, concentrating on scoring a hit when you are free fencing uh, is a symptom of having a sports mentality. Um, in modern sports fencing, this is correct. Uh, modern sports fencing is a game where you're trying to score more points than the other person to win a match to proceed in the tournament, to, to win prizes, uh, to get medals, etc, etc. Um, the purpose of a martial arts system in its true historical form uh, is to train you for real combat, for a live fight. Um, in a live fight, the priority is to survive the fight. Most of the time, of course, back in the day, it would be necessary to take out the other person, to disarm them, cripple them, or kill them, to necessitate surviving the fight. Um, however, the goal is on survival and therefore defence, which is in fact the origin of the word fencing. Um, unfortunately, too many modern practitioners come into historical fencing or other historical European martial arts having been culturally programmed by a diet of sports. And so they view these things in a very competitive way. I want to beat the other person. I want to score more points. Um, what you should be thinking is, I don't want to die. And it's only in that context that these historical systems make sense. So when you're trying to apply your techniques, particularly in free fencing, um, you should always try to deal with the other opponent's weapon and minimize the opportunity for your opponent to strike you before you launch attacks on the other person. Um, in other words, cover the line, uh, find the other person's weapon, bind their blade out the road, uh, use footwork to get an angle where you're not directly threatened, uh, whatever it is your system advocates. Um, but fence securely or fence safely and think first and foremost about defense Scoring the hit comes last. This is the real martial arts mentality. Okay, so that brings me to the end of our list of the four biggest problem areas in the practice of historical fencing. So just briefly to summarize, to finish off. Uh, number one problem area, bad or incorrect posture or body stance. Um, Number two, moving like a modern sports person and not like a historical warrior or martial artist. Uh, number three, not understanding the original weapon design correctly and training to use modern training tools rather than historical weapons. Uh, and number four, um, approaching combat with the idea of scoring more points or more hits than your opponent. Um, this is a sports mentality, not a martial arts mentality. Okay, so that brings us to the end of today's video. I uh, hope that's interesting for you, no matter what style of historical fencing it is that you practice. Um, next week, I'll be back with another tutorial video on a different topic. Take care, everyone.